And I looked around and I observed, and on this cruise, every single woman with gray hair was completely overlooked and in fact, actually invisible, not seen at all. Guys, welcome back to ASCC Overflowing Buckets, your go-to podcast where people give freely from their overflowing buckets to fill others up. And today, we're so thrilled to have a very special guest who's been making waves in the business world for decades. She's a seasoned business development expert and the maturepreneur maverick. She has a wealth of experience, having worked her way up from the ground up in corporate America to becoming a successful entrepreneur and mentor herself. In this episode, we'll be diving deep into the world of mature entrepreneurship. She will share her insights on the unique challenges and opportunities that come with starting or growing a business later in life. Everyone, let's welcome Jeanette Anderson. Woo! Hey, Jeanette! I'm so happy to be here. And I love how bubbly you are. It's great, especially first thing in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> well, for us, it's already 10 o'clock in the morning. So yeah. we've been, I've been, we've been up for a hot minute and it's Monday. So that means we are just flying today. So let me ask you, what got you into this maturepreneur? concept. I, I, I'd never heard of maturepreneur until I met yeah. you, Jack. Well, I don't know if I came up with the word, but I was using it long before I saw it anywhere else. Um, so I'm claiming it. Uh, so basically, what, frankly, what got me into this was somebody pissed me off, frankly. So I was on a crew. So many great, great things come when we're just pissed. Yeah, I, you, exactly. just, you just take that energy and you just channel it to, to win. Exactly. I love that. Well, I've been helping entrepreneurs grow their business for over 40, for almost 45 years now. Every time I stop and do the math, it's like, oh my God, there's more, more numbers there. Anyway, um, and love it. Still stupidly in love with what I do. Um, for a long time, I was supporting women um, to really figure out how to profit from living their purpose. And I was on the marketers cruise, which is for business people around the world. It's actually a lot of work. Yeah, right. Work cruise, but it really is. And I, uh, there's a bit of a background echo or something, but I'm not sure what that's from. Uh, but anyways, I was on this cruise. I was at something called Pizza and Profits. And in, in um, this networking meeting, I was talking to a group of people. Someone asked me, what do you do? I was mid-sentence answering him and he turned and started talking to someone else. And I thought, oh, what a dick. So I excused myself and walked away and politely and um, went to the next group. And the exact same thing happened. And I was like, huh, okay, well, it can't be all of them. Maybe I'm not showing up. So I thought about it. And it's like, no, I'm pretty present. I have, you know, polka dot glasses and blue hair. And I'm pretty um, there, right? And it wasn't that. So I started to get curious. And I looked around and I observed. And on this cruise, every single woman with gray hair was completely overlooked and in fact actually invisible not seen at all and some of the older men and i started to really kind of wonder about that doing did some research and discovered that um ageism is alive and well um and even though i knew notionally that was the case it was the first time it really impinged on me and so i was like well no 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 just because i have gray hair doesn't mean I'm suddenly incompetent or incapable. In fact, yeah. it means I have a lot more experience than you. So like move over. And There's so wisdom that you can share so that, that they like, you can actually tell people where the potholes are or yeah. where the, you know, where, where people go astray and you could actually share your wisdom so that they can actually get to their destination with more ease. Yes, and saving more time and more money, exactly. So I really started to look into it and, and discovered a bunch of really fascinating things. There's what I call two global epidemics and two global trends that no one is paying attention to. And it just makes me tilt my head and go, huh? Um, and so 
the more that I dive into this, the more passionate I get about it, the more I understand that our society really needs to wake up to uh, fundamental change. It used to be you retired at 65, you died at 75, but that's so 1940. That is, has been the case for decades. And in fact, now people are living 20, 30, 40 years beyond that. And so um, th they're what I call hashtag not done by a long shot. Right. So, There's still, you know, they still have purpose. Yeah. And not, not ready to, to die. They still want to, to want to have a purpose in, in their contributions to society and the world. And Absolutely. Have so much more to offer. Absolutely. Yeah. So these, these trends and, and epidemics, they're basically, <laughs> The one of the trends is that there's more entrepreneurs coming into the marketplace now than at any time in history ever. And the reason for that is all the, the Gen Xers and boomers are creating businesses and the tail end of what I call the COVID refugees, but mostly it's boomers and, and Gen Xers who either have to or choose to create a business. What's going on is um, there's more of them coming into the marketplace. That's one big trend. And we're talking millions and millions and millions. Um, so by a quantum leap more than usual. Uh, the second thing is that part of the reason for that is that um, the uh, there's what I call a, a poverty crisis or epidemic. What people don't realize is that 65% of Canadians and between 50 and 90% of Americans, depending on the geographic area and the demographic band, cannot afford to retire. That means they have to make money to be able to survive or be okay. So, and that's anywhere from food and housing insecurity to, um, you know, so like being potentially homeless or not able to eat to... Yeah. Maybe they have to sell their house and downsize or, you know, they can't, they can't go anywhere or do anything. So that's after a lifetime of working, that's very, very, very sad. And, and um, also not being addressed by anyone. It's, it's um, if 65% of the population had a disease, we would be all over it. But right. 65 percent of the population living in poverty or in you know financial insecurity in needs yeah or, yeah or or having a strong need yeah. yeah and that's interesting i love that we're having this conversation i love that we're bringing this up because i do know and when we do visit with others we're seeing it we're yeah. seeing in other places they are sell they're trying to figure it out if they sell their house and they move and they're and what's it's it's a little heartbreaking because they're trying to do the math to see how yeah. how long that money is going to last yeah right and, and that's the problem is people are living longer and longer and longer that's not a problem but they haven't uh, accounted for that in in their financial planning and so forth it used to be again that if you saved enough for 10 20 years you were fine but people are living 30 40 years longer and who would have expected that cost of groceries would have doubled in the last, what, four years? Yeah, exactly. Um, so we've got um, a an epidemic in terms of the, or a crisis in terms of the poverty. We've got, uh, as a result, many, many people, because good luck trying to get a job if you're older, uh, like literally not possible. I have friends who've been on 27 interviews and gotten sent out hundreds and hundreds of resumes highly qualified can't get a job as soon as they find out how old she is she she doesn't get to interview number two or three so uh it's not easy to get a job especially at an appropriate level um and and so you pretty much have no choice but to start your own business except there's no resources targeted at this market to support them with that uh, these are people transitioning from being employees their whole lives to becoming an entrepreneur <clears throat> Very few trainings, no funding, absolutely no funding. Good luck trying to get a loan or venture capital or even business insurance. Like you, you can't after 60. And these are all systemic ageist. Um, so after age 60, if I want well, access to business resources, the likelihood of me getting, it's like if I needed a liver transplant, yep. right? Yep. Because of my age, I'm at a high risk to these yep. investors. So they won't take me on. 
So right. what, that, what would cause an investor to want to, who, the people who have these resources? Yeah. What value could we provide to them that makes them say, you know what, this is actually a great opportunity and, and these are some ways that we could actually lower the risk mm -hmm. so that um, it's a good investment for us to invest in maturepreneurs. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, one, get with the get with the statistics. Um, boomers are living longer and functionally longer. Um, the odds are that if you invest in a boomer, you've got ten to twenty years that that per, or hire them for that matter. Um, they'll be with you for ten to twenty years. They're loyal. They stay longer, etc. If you wait, wait, they're loyal. Yeah. Because one of the challenges that I know a lot of entrepreneurs, so I don't want to glass that over because I know a challenge that a lot of entrepreneurs do have is what we don't want to do is invest our time, money, and energy to train somebody to have them turn over and leave. Exactly. Right. So to have somebody who's willing to come in, invest, to give, and to be a part of the team long term and have a long term vision. Versus yes. just like, versus, okay, I'm going to use this person for this. I'm going to use this job for this. I'm going to, and they use each job as a stepping stone yes. versus exactly. using that job as an entrepreneur, like as a family that they're going to grow together with. Exactly. And I know like as an employer, that is what I am looking for. I don't mm -hmm. need the most qualified. I need this person that's going to want to grow with me. Exactly. So, so we have that loyalty and you're yep. bringing in the experience. Yes, absolutely. Experience Patience. and expertise um, because they've been doing things longer. You know, one of the downsides it, it can be, can be depending on the person, that they have been doing things longer and tend to bring the past forward, uh, which helps with context, with providing context, but doesn't necessarily help in terms of innovation and things are changing so quickly, etc. Uh, so, so when they are adaptable and, and forward thinking, then they bring the best of their wisdom from the past to this forward thinking perspective for the, the future. And so it's critical. Okay, so I'm sorry, to inter but I just want to break these down into little yep. segments, because I, I feel like like we, these things, people just throw out there, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. nobody actually dives into really, what does that mean? So, yeah. so that what we, we see this is like, somebody says, well, when I was 20, yeah. I did this. And maybe a better approach could be, oh, I see to have somebody who would take a beat yeah. and be able to be open-minded to recognizing the instead of saying, oh, I'm not really tech savvy. This wasn't, yeah. so, but to recognize that they do have the capacity to learn. We have the capacity to learn as we age yeah. and not to use our age as an excuse to not to move forward. Once yeah. we overcome that, yeah. that, that the world is our oyster because now we have wisdom and yeah. openness. Yes, absolutely. Well, and, and, you know, often people will make the comment about uh, a lot of older people aren't tech savvy. It's really fascinating to me because I know young people who are not, and I know lots of older people who run circles around younger people in terms of, you know, being able to do video or edits or do technical tasks. So I think it's, it is a stereotype that's not necessarily true. The reality is we grew up with all of those technical changes, um, more so and longer than, and, and the, the introduction of them. So we're actually more adept at knowing how change happens and, and having seen lots of changes. Uh, versus those who were born with a you know a smartphone in their hand, they haven't had to do as much adapting. One of the really cool things that I think is important to bring into any workplace or business or whatever is the recognition that um, innovation. We're going to be really the source of a lot of innovation, and there's a couple of reasons for that. Now, younger people innovate from a blank slate because it's, you know, they don't, they, they are starting fresh, which is great value for that as well. 
Absolutely. And so that's why working together in intergenerational teams when you're trying to innovate is really valuable because then older people bring what I call context. So they can see the big picture and they, they know kind of what has or hasn't worked or could work or couldn't work because of that contextual framing. That experience. Can we just call it, can we call us experienced people yeah. versus, yeah, let's go yeah, with experienced yeah, people. Exactly. <laughs> And, and really, um, <clears throat> it's it's a great combination when you bring that anything's possible blank slate to yes. experience and context. People innovate faster, better, and create solutions more. Um, one of the reasons why boomers are going to be the boomers and Gen Xers are going to be the source of so much innovation is because there's so many things that we want to solve and need to solve for ourselves and others. And uh, so, and we're, we're um, really a lot of people, like you mentioned, so 65% give or take have to work, but many of them also wanna work. And of the other 35%, a good portion, and, and I'm estimate, cause this is a harder number to statistic to get, that at least, um, 20% of those continue to work because they want to make a difference. They want to contribute. Um, the reality is that when we have purpose in life, especially later, uh, we live seven years longer, qualitative years, happier, healthier. When, we're, when we don't have purpose and we're isolated, we live eight years less and unhealthier and unhappier. So I love that you said qualitative years, because that's yeah. really, we're not looking for more years. We're looking for more quality at this, mm -hmm. at this place in our life. I like that purpose yeah. and quality. And so yeah. having purpose really matters. And that's part of what, um, for anybody at any point, but especially as you're reinventing yourself, as you're moving into, you know, your last chapter, whatever you want to call it, or your fourth quarter, your, you know, third act, there's many, many names mm -hmm. for it. Um, and so that really makes a difference when people have that sense of purpose. So there's really about 80% of the population, give or take, depending on the country, that are still working well past quote unquote retirement age because they really want to make a difference. They need to make money. They need to want, they want to make an impact they want to make an income. And most people don't recognize that. So um, I think it's a changing time. When these people come in, they're bringing all sorts of solutions that don't currently exist. So there's going to be a lot of innovation that's happening. So one of the things that I have seen is, um, I think because there is that, um, that dismissal of folks who are not like us, yeah. right? Who don't dismissal of folks who don't um, who don't look like us, act like us, same age, do the same experiences. Yeah. Um, I think that's just across the board, right? Mm -hmm. So it mm -hmm. seems like what we're looking to do is, d is refine, redefine openness mm -hmm. in our society mm -hmm. to being open to seeing the value in others, despite their the data, the met yeah. the data metrics of age, gender, I don't even know, yeah. um, all the things, right? Yeah. And if we can eliminate yeah. those and just boil down to the actual value yeah. and maybe the character, right? Mm -hmm. The character, the value, and there's actually tests for that. Mm -hmm. They're just not going to be on the, uh, uh, the citizenship form when somebody comes and takes a citizenship, how, how many people, what's their gender, what's their age, what's their this, it's not on that, but it's, so that means we're going to need to dive deeper into defining their character, their values, and see if that's what causes us to align, which seems like we're also going to, when we meet somebody, ask more interesting questions. Mm -hmm. So when we sit with somebody and we're of a different age, what mm -hmm. are some things we can't change others. Mm -hmm. We can change, we can empower ourselves. Mm -hmm. So what can we do as mature preneurs? I love mm -hmm. that word. Every time I say it, the first time I, I, I want you to know, I had to practice that about 10 times, I know, preneur, it's but it's starting to roll off my tongue, mature preneur. So as a mature preneur, 
I'm, and I don't want to break down, but to gently have others see our value, to see our light, to, um, to see our character, mm -hmm. right? What can we do, not just for the folks who are hiring us, but maybe it's as um, if we're an entrepreneur, uh, you know, uh, to hire us for uh, in their business, but also maybe employ us mm -hmm. and also our team members. Mm -hmm. How do we do that in a, in a kind, loving, open, real way that brings amazing results and fast? Uh, you ask great questions um, <clears throat> that no one else has asked me, so I really love that. Um, I think that, well, first of all, I think it's also very loving to be a fierce advocate um, because we do need to wake people up to prejudices because a lot of them are very invisible and condoned. There's condoned prejudices in our society. Ageism is one of them. Sizeism is another. Right. And and there is and there um, they impact a lot of what happens uh, consciously or unconsciously. So the first thing that we need to do is check out our own brain, because we have a lot of unconscious ageism within ourselves. Yes. Right. Well, and with social media, our brain is you're right. Our brain is taught to judge at a quicker mm -hmm at a quicker level, like we can make a judgment like this, that is, yeah. has zero thought behind it. It's just based purely on not even a gut, nothing. It's just a quick judgment. And we're just, as with social media, as with all this, with the scrolling and everything else, we're at a, we can judge at a super high level, which, yeah. so how can we use that in our benefit, knowing that people can judge at a super high level? How can we yeah. use that as our benefit? Well, part of it is, like I was saying, we need to be aware of the ageism in our own brain. There's so many things, like even just something as simple as saying, you look really good for your age. <laughs> what, what you oh, age? Is that a qualifier? I know. We say that kind of thing all the time. We give really ageist, you know, birthday cards and we just, there's a bunch of things. There's a, a blog called yo is this ageist so one of the things you can do is if you're curious go and put that uh, go and put that thought or that concept or that statement or whatever in there and um she will give you some feedback on um how that thinking may not be very effective so um that's one thing Two, educate yourself about ageism and its impact so that you can be an advocate recognize it call it out gently fiercely whatever the situation warrants and whatever your style is but be a stand for changing societal norms by addressing them don't just let them slide that's how we change prejudices in so, somewhere and say something right so it sounds like if you can't so i um i was taught this term and i think a lot of times people think that if they bring something up it's a confrontation Right. But what I come to find out is that I only will say something if I care enough about you to yes. bring it up. So it's not a confrontation. Now it's become a carefrontation. So if I care enough about you, yeah. right, exactly. I'll bring up, you know, and you're, and you're funny. It's kind of like, oh, wow, you have a lot of energy for your age. Yeah. yeah. Right. Or, wow, you look, you, you seem so vibrant for your age. Yeah, and exactly. I'm like, I think I'm quite vibrant for any age, but thank you. And I, I do accept that. And I say thank you because I do recognize that this is, it is true. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. thank you. And, and I'm like, what do you mean for this age? Right. Yeah. In a very joking, loving, kind way. And yeah. then I also recognize that it is a compliment. It is a sincere and loving compliment. Yeah. So if I want to receive more compliments, I'm not going to knock them down, but I'll yeah. also bring up like, what do you mean my age? Exactly. Right? And, yeah. and then they're like, Oh, I didn't mean that. I was like, I'm just kidding. But you know what I, you know, I was like, thank you very yeah. much. And just thank them for wanting to give me a sincere compliment. Mm -hmm. And that's how I've handled it in the past. Yeah. 
and and that can work very well. Um, sometimes it needs to be more direct. Sometimes it's um, systemic, and so it has to be called out um, in terms of things like lobbying or advocacy. There's all different levels of addressing it. But really, I think um, educating yourself. There's a really good book called um, "This Chair Rocks: A Manifesto Against Ageism" by Ashton Applewhite that I highly recommend. Uh, it really helps us to become aware of all the various subtle, insidious, overt ways that this impacts. So that's one thing: is become educated and aware, and an advocate. So okay, so when you qualify a compliment with for your age, mm -hmm. right? What yeah. are some other things that we can um, avoid that my kids can mm -hmm. probably avoid saying, even at, even jokingly, especially well, even jokingly, but if they're looking to work together in yeah. a workplace or hire or, or to change your mindset for your age as a qualifier, what mm -hmm. else? Well, for for one thing is don't assume that they're um, doddering and and um, you know that they they uh, don't know or don't don't come with those assumptions in place. Be curious, um, ask questions. Don't just assume and project, which is basically true of any and all prejudices. Um, ask questions. Find out. If you're not sure, ask. Leave with uh, curiosity. I love that. Yeah. And, and and making decisions for people. Ask them. Um, so that's one thing. Another thing that I would say is really take a look for what what are the benefits that this person can provide. So, for instance, um, how can you call on their experience? How can you call on expertise? What can you what can they bring to the party? And starting from strengths, and that goes for anybody at any age. So we yes. get to say that with older people, right? And and by the way, ageism goes both ways, very young and very old. Um, yes, we've seen it both ways, right? Because like, we'll say, oh, they're so naive. Oh, well, that was like, oh, if only they knew. Ah, yeah, yeah exactly. ab absolutely. Yeah. yeah. They don't have the experience, therefore they're not valuable. Or they've got too much experience, so therefore they're not, uh, you know, employable. So it's it goes both ways. Um, the other thing that I would suggest is, really um, in that process of asking questions, be open both ways to um, hearing differences, hearing that things could be seen differently, come out from a different perspective, that it's not one way. And that goes both ways, that's on both sides, right? We yes. all need to be more open-minded, um, not, <laughs> you know, not to the point of, of not, having opinions or not knowing what we know or whatever, but really being open to, oh, there might be a different approach here. There might be a different well, maybe, way. It sounds like we need to release the judgment we have around our opinion. Yes. Right? Yeah. Like, oh, she has blue hair. She likes her blue hair. Yeah. Oh, her blue hair. Oh, right? Yeah, exactly. it's, it's, it, there's a fact and then there's an opinion and then there's a judgment. And yes. the judgment can go both ways. Oh, I love her blue hair or, oh, oh, I hate her blue hair. It, yeah. It's that it's releasing that quick judgment without any facts based around the opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, and even if we have the facts, you know, it, it, there's still, we still bring our beliefs to it and our filters and our frame on the world. It, you know, human beings are very subjective. We, we like to think we're objective, but we're not. We needed it for survival at one point, right? Exactly. And so just being aware of that and pausing long enough to go, okay, wait a minute, am I throwing all my stuff on this or is it what's really going on here? Or what is the real opportunity or possibility? Um, so I think that one, and, and one of the other things that I would really advocate is, you know, I was saying there's these trends and, and so forth going on and no one's paying attention. There's what I call a perfect storm of opportunity right now for business owners, for service providers, for the marketplace in general. There is this huge market with a great deal of demand and need. And by the way, the other side of that, 35, or 97 0.5% of the wealth right now is in the hands of one demographic, the boomers. And that's the first time in history that's ever happened. 
that so much wealth is in one, the control of one group. So what, here's what's interesting. 97.5% of the wealth is in the boomers. 79.5. 79.5. Okay. So 80%. I'm just going to round 80% of the wealth is with the boomers, but we're also finding that boomers still have a strong need to still have to work because it, even though they're controlling the bulk of the wealth, it's not enough. It's not enough. Right. Yeah, it's well, it is for that 30 for that, maybe not the Gen X. Yeah. So the 35 percent of the people who have control all that wealth um, are fine and they are incredible consumers who want to build nonprofits and social enterprises and businesses that contribute. But no one is is targeting them or helping them with that. Oh, there's a huge amount of money and a huge amount of poverty or need so and, and by the way the, the boomers so they're that, the, but they're the ones that can employ yes uh, can employ can create uh, amazing enterprises have investments that can provide capital all sorts of things so we've got very rich boomers and we've got boomers that need to create an income in order to carry on uh, so lots of need lots of supply lots of demand and no one's targeting this market. Like if you look at commercials on TV, what are they for? They're for Viagra and Depends and stair lifts and seniors home. <laughs> None of that targets the 80% of us that are reinventing and refiring. It's all about those who are retired. And most of us are refiring, not retiring. So the marketplace needs to recognize that there is a huge opportunity here to serve this market, to support this market in bringing innovation and change. And there's a ton of money to be made from this market, but so, no one's targeting us. It's really so, dumb. <laughs> so what is the best way to, because we're, we're, you know, so if there's a need, Mm -hmm. So I, I'm my brain, like I'm trying to process at the same time. So yeah. like there's a need. Yeah. How can we best serve this market and fulfill that need in such a way that it'll compound and just go to that next level and it'll just raise our society to that next level and, um, and we can just move forward. Yeah. I, Bettina, I just love the consciousness behind your questions because they are very, very win-win oriented. Like you're really thinking about big picture support and, and I think that's beautiful. It's a really lovely orientation um, that not a lot of people have. So I, I really love that. Um, I think that one of the things, you know, first of all, in a society where anyone is suffering, everyone is disadvantaged. Um, so we can't have 65% of the population dealing with, you know, financial insecurity. We just can't and not be healthy as a society. So we need to address this. That's one thing. And it's not being addressed by government, by society, etc. cetera. Um, the, the positive side of that is when we enable and support this demographic to work together with younger generations. And by the way, yes. um, very soon, there will be more people going out of the workplace than coming into it. And if you stop and think about that, that's a problem. Yeah. So unless this demographic is empowered to balance that out and provide services and, and support and staffing and so forth, we're going to be in a really big problem. Uh, so we need uh, them and we need to empower them. So one of the ways to do that is to figure out how do I target this market so that I can support them. If I'm Staples or if I'm, you know, um, Best Buy or if I am a bank, how do I create products and services that appeal to this market? How do I start marketing to this market? How do I perhaps create, you know, classes, training, education, support, for this market to empower and enable them. How do I start bringing them into our enterprises? You know, nothing frustrates me more than I, because I, you know, working in this space, I see organizations that support older people staffed by nothing but 20 somethings and 30 somethings. It's like, yeah. if you want to support older people, how about you hire them? How about yes. You know what's interesting is we, we went through a season and I think, and, and I'm starting to see evidence that there's a little backtracking on this where they were really working to support 
um, the younger generation by bringing ping pong tables and coffees and all the all the all the things into the workplace. And I saw something the other day is that there's big corporations that there's a big talk now that they are not wanting folks who don't want to come into work, who who are not um, driven to support the um, the corporate vision. Mm -hmm. Very self-driven versus corporate driven. And mm -hmm. I think that there's a shift in our society where it used to be very much like, hey, we got to figure out how to support the employee, the employee, the employee, the employee. And I think that pendulum may have, there has become a little, possibly a little bit of entitlement there. Yeah. And um, I'm hearing, um, not experiencing because I'm not in that that type of workforce, but what I'm hearing is that a lot of corporations are kind of tired of it. Mm -hmm. Right. They really they're not they're like, I want to support our employees, but I yeah. also don't appreciate being entitled like their entitlement. Yeah. And um, I think I think we need to, like in everything, do a both and not an either or. Um, and, you know, like you said, the pendulum swings. Well, how about if we could just bring it into the center where we value employees, make it a really wonderful workplace that's productive and supportive and um have the work get done in a way that's really um, rewarding, profitable, yeah. and rewarding. And, I think, and I think that's part of it too. It's like it's like as a as an um, entrepreneur, mm -hmm. and the joke used to be, "I'll work 80, 100, 120 hours a week, right?" Mm -hmm. Because it's I enjoy it. Yes, right. It's my joy. I'm driven. I see a purpose in it. I see a long term vision. Yes. And I do believe that if corporations will do that for 20 year olds, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, we're all on board for that. We're, we're we are all along for the ride. That's true. There are generational differences, though. Millennials um, tend to work at places for statistically about two and a half years, two to two and a half years, and then move on. That's part of how they move yeah. the world, right? Um, which is why if you hire a boomer, you're more likely to have that employee for longer um, or in, invest in one. They're more likely to work on the, the business longer. Um, yes, there is the, the possibility that they might get sick and 20, 30, 40 year olds get cancer as well and, and get sick and disappear or get, you know, whatever the case may be. Well, so, it used to be, you know, this used to be a concern for hiring women because they would get pregnant. Yeah. And, yeah. That used to, and there was, that used to be the big concern. And, and the big solution there was to have childcare in the workplace and this, and there was like those kind of solutions. This seems like it's not that complicated. It's, it's really not actually, it's just a matter of overcoming prejudices. Um, so part of it is uh, really serving and supporting this market. And one of the things that is also a, a big issue right now, and it kind of ties into what you're talking about in the workplace uh, discussion, is there's a loneliness epidemic. One oh, in yes. people in the North America say that loneliness is impacting their mental health. Yes, this is partially still a hangover from COVID, um, our society, how we've shifted. And of course, that really impacts older people and solopreneurs or entrepreneurs who work on their own. So when you put those together, that creates an issue um, that needs to be supported as well. Even even in terms of the workplace, people feel isolated and working from home can create that. Um, we need community. We need conscious communities. We're, so we're pack animals. Yes. Yeah. One of the things that corporations can do is rather than creating distractions at work, create community at work. That sense of belonging, that sense of being part of something. And like you said, purpose. Why? Why does the organization exist? Why do you want to support it? What's your why? And how does that align with the business? That's an important um, thing to consider. And it's really important for uh, mature entrepreneurs to clarify their why, well, any entrepreneur to clarify their why, why they do what they do, because that's what people buy. They don't buy what you do. They buy why you do it. That's how we differentiate ourselves. That's how people choose what organizations they're going to be aligned with. So whether it's a corporate workplace or whether it's a boomer starting their business, we need 
to be clear on our why and our purpose, and we need conscious community. And when I say conscious community, I mean communities that support us in being who we want to be, getting where we want to get. And that's one of the big gaps in the market as well. There, this is a huge, this is just under, this market is just under a billion people worldwide. That's a huge market, but there are no communities or they're not gathered anywhere. There's very few organizations, groups, et cetera, et cetera, that gather these people, mature entrepreneurs specifically. Mm -hmm. There's lots, lots of stuff about ageism, lots of stuff about retirement. But right. Those of us who are and they call them networking events, right? Yeah. So sometimes you can join a, a networking group for the yep. specific of business and uh and there's i i do see a big gap in that um yep. we're actually working on building a community within our community right now Very of cool. realtors and it's what we do we have a weekly mastermind of like-minded people we ho host events we do big small that is just open to all realtors because we do understand that community is huge yep. like that need and that drive. And sometimes um, I think it's also important that you don't just have one person. Like, let's mm -hmm. say there's a lot of this. I, I've come, to, I meet people from corporations. They have a very linear idea of relationships, mm -hmm. right? Like I work for this person, this person, it's very, the relationship is linear versus out. So mm -hmm. I do see that pendulum coming. Like that was the purpose of the pool tables and these, these mm -hmm. areas, right? Where people yeah. could come together, get these ideas and build that community and yeah. get work done and have a, and get work done so that we're driven with purpose. Yes. Right. Yes. As, and, and working towards a common goal, a championship per se. Right. Yeah. Yes. And, and so you're right. Networking is a way to kind of gather, but again, most, and you're, you're seeing now in networking, it's very interesting. So I mentioned the marketers cruise back then there was about, um, out of the 450 people that were on the cruise, there was maybe 20 people that were over 60, let's say. Now it's probably 30% of the people on the cruise are in this demographic. And what people don't recognize or realize is <clears throat> within 25 years, one in four people are going to be over 65. So we really do need to start thinking about how do we shift society, the workplace, networking meetings, everything. Them. Yeah. To include them. So maybe that, and, and I, and maybe when we create these events, we don't, um, we don't, the niches are maybe not as based on things that would come in on a poll on a citizenship. What is that called where they go door to door and they're like, Hey, a census, a census. A census. If yeah. it's on a census, it's not a qualifier. Maybe that, maybe that just needs to be like the framework. If it's on a census, it's not a qualifier, but the qualifier for these events are more value, character, yeah. um, experience driven. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that, um, you know, between the kind of the challenge with having to make money, the loneliness epidemic. We need one another more. There, there is lots of money in this market that people can, can, they're a profitable market to go after. And there is, it's a huge market. So businesses need to really start thinking strategically about how do we serve this, this group of people? How do we capitalize on this group of people? Finish answering your question about what we bring um, for the people who are looking to get into a business or become a mature entrepreneur, whether that's a side hustle or creating a global enterprise or movement, anywhere in between, whatever people are inventing for themselves, um, we give them a lot of things, resources, support, training, etc. But I think more than anything else, Bettina, hope. Because there's a lot of despair for people as we get older. There's a lot of challenges. There's a lot of societal you know like there's there's there is uh nothing like being invisible to make you question whether or not you matter anymore mm. there's nothing like being dismissed or overlooked to make you wonder why you worked so hard your whole life and contributed there's there can be a lot of despair and so uh what people need all people at all ages but especially this market is hope things are shifting 
and that they do still matter. They do still make a difference. And there are opportunities, uh, incredible opportunities for them to continue to be vital, to contribute and to matter. I love that. Okay. I want one other question. So if we want to reach these folks, right? Mm -hmm. um, let's, let's just say boomers, Gen X's, I'd say the bulk of them are going to be on Facebook versus TikTok, Insta or anything like that. Correct. That's yep. their, their preferred yep. platform or yep. our preferred platform. Look at me, they, us, me. Yeah. Um, yes. And uh, that is shifting as well. There's a lot of what is called grand fluencers. So older influencers that are on Instagram, TikTok, um, YouTube, a lot, of course. Um, so as individuals, predominantly um, Facebook, unless they are the ones who are kind of late stage career and transitioning into uh, deciding what they're going to do, et cetera, then, then a lot of them are on LinkedIn. So it really depends on which sub market you're going mm -hmm. after in this, uh, as with any kind of marketing targeting. Um, and I think really the challenge is they're not gathered. So there's a few groups that are for people who are older, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but not very active, not very, you know, engaged. Um, so we need, we need more communities that are really bringing value to these, to this group. So like AARP, is that the yeah. old folks thing? It's, <laughs> I, I didn't call it that, but AARP, but I, I think when I get the, the, when I saw the flyer, I was like, what? But it's all about a leisure lifestyle, how to get a leisure lifestyle versus, um, versus purpose. Every, and it's not about fulfilling a need and getting compensated for it. There's no, com there's no exchange of compensation. It's very much like consumer. We can sell to them yes. as a consumer, um, by providing a leisure lifestyle. Well, it's the prejudices inherent in the name, the American Association of Retired Persons, Canadian Association of Retired Persons, mm. they're representing 20% of the market. They think they're representing everybody who's over 65 or whatever. They're not. They're, they're missing the boat on 80% of us because we are so not. So it's be retired and rehired. Yes, refired. Yeah. Refired, right? Yeah. So... Um, so maybe they can be A A R R R P. <laughs> yes. A A R R P. A R A A R P. Actually, just did I just say you're yeah. welcome. A A R R P. Like this <laughs> could be like if we could just put an R over that R, that could be a phenomenal branding and an opportunity for them to actually increase their yeah. target. Because they, they already have access to the data, and now they can create more value and really, oh, somebody needs to align with them. Hey, call us. If you know <laughs> the person at AARP, have them call us. We got you. Well, and I and I have been trying to get in front of them and CARP to talk about this, to say, can we put a business column in your magazine? Can we, you know, et cetera. And they just don't see it yet. It's not on their radar. It's not on the radar of most people. That's so why we need I, to rephrase I, that question then. We need to yeah. say, what is it going to take for us to be, to get that into, the, into your, yeah. your branding? What yes. is it going to take for it to go on your magazine, to get on your website, to get on your social media? Because there's a need of 65% of your audience that you're not fulfilling. Exactly. And, and also follow it up with the data, the financial data of why this will benefit them more than only targeting retirees. Yes. And, and targeting the retirees who want to continue their purpose, who wants to, you right. can be retired essentially and still contribute for yes. financial gain. Absolutely. Oh, Absolutely. Girl, let's do this. <laughs> I'm on it. I'm on it. I appreciate you you stepping into the fray because the more of us that are having these conversations and talking to them and trying to get them to open their brains and their minds, um, the better. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate your time. I appreciate you sharing the knowledge and I appreciate you on this mission. I feel a little bit like um, because I am younger and just entering this genre, yeah. I feel so grateful that I'm going to get to benefit from all the work that you're putting in. So thank you, thank you, thank you. I was going to say, you know, if you're younger and you're listening to this, 
purely out of self-preservation, help this movement along so that you don't have to deal with this BS when you're older. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks to everybody for listening. And thank you, Bettina, for having such a beautifully um, open, conscious mind and heart. I love it. Oh, I appreciate you.